Patrice Simon is a professor in Université Paul Sabatier in Toulouse, France. Uh, he has previously been the coordinator of the Alistor ERI and is also into his uh, second ERC and uh, will teach us, I think, or tell us, <laughs> tell us. at least, uh, what you can do if you really master methods of electrochemical uh, uh, nature. So, Patrice. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Patrick. And uh, I would like to thank you for uh, the kind uh, invitation. So my talk is going to be a bit different, I would say, and complement the two previous talks because I'm going to be uh, more focused a bit on uh, science, scientific points uh, on science, I would say. So what we are doing, the laser, okay. What we do at the lab is to try to improve the power performance of uh, the electrochemical energy storage devices. So you have here those, uh, uh, this is a Ragoni plot with high power and energy density. So these are the electrochemical capacitors or supercapacitors, which are high power devices. These are the batteries, which are high energy storage devices, but limited power density. And the goal is to reach here this region with high power, high energy. So to do that, we, you have two ways. Or you try to increase the energy density of uh, uh, the, those supercapacitors, or you can try uh, uh, in another way to increase the power density on batteries. And I will um, give you a couple of examples here on the first part, how the work we, we, we did and we still are doing on the uh, understanding the charge transfer, the ion transfer into porous electrodes, doing electrochemistry at the nanoscale uh, to try to improve the performance of those uh, 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 porous carbon supercapacitors. And uh, what we are currently doing on uh, materials with, uh, uh, for battery with redox reactions, but not limited by diffusion using 2D materials. So I will start by, uh, I will say, supercapacitors. So as you can see here, supercaps, I think I will go here, be better, safer. So um, supercapacitors, they are high power energy storage devices that store the charge electrostatically. So what you do, you take two carbon electrodes, high surface area carbon electrode with very high surface area, 1500 square meter per gram. And when you polarize those two electrodes inside the electrolyte, what you can do simply is to absorb the ions to balance the charge. So if you inject holes at a positive carbon electrode, then you have anions at, uh, which are absorbed onto a carbon surface. And by doing that, what you do is that you store a capacitor, the double layer capacitance, which is proportional to, um, is it my eyes or is it uh, slightly, uh, okay. The, so I'm gonna step back, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so the capacitance is proportional to the dielectric constant of the electrolyte, epsilon here, and uh, changes with a reverse of the approaching distance of the ion to the carbon surface, okay. Basically, this capacitance is about 10 to 20 microfarad per square centimeter. And if you use super high square meter, uh, surface area, 1,500, 2,000 uh, square meter per gram, you can store more than 100 first per gram of carbon. So this is how the charge is stored in those supercapacitors. No redox reactions. And you have a sketch here of two porous carbon electrodes, the electrolyte. And you can see here the electrolyte ions inside the porous carbon. Okay, but here this highlights the key role of a carbon electrolyte interface. And what we did, uh, we used uh, for years modern materials, model carbons that we prepared in the lab. You start from titanium carbide, you do the chlorination at different temperatures, and you remove the titanium through gas phase, and you end up with a carbon which is porous. And you can really nicely control the pore size of a carbon. And years ago, what we did, this is the capacitance of the, this is the gravimetric capacitance of a carbon divided by the surface area and versus the carbon pore size, what we have shown years ago was that when you prepare carbons with small pore size, with a pore size smaller than the size of a solvated ions, which is typically between one and two nanometers, then what you, what you can do, you increase drastically the capacitance, the charge storage in those nanopores, which are smaller than the size of the solvated ions. So what did we say at that time? Uh, it's a long time ago, we proposed that those nanopores were accessible to the ions because the ions were partially dissolvate to enter those pores. And you, when you partially dissolvate, you decrease the approaching distance, and then you increase the capacitance. Okay, so that we did a lot of work on that since uh, 2006. Uh, now we know more or less what happens, but the question is, 
does only the pore size is interesting. So is it, do we have other way to uh, uh, increase this uh, uh, capacitance and is it only driven by the pore size? So to answer this question, we made a step back and we used 2D graphene. Why? Because 2D graphene, they are graphene materials, they are sp2 carbons. So they are uh, completely ordered carbons. And what we did, you can take, a, a, can grow a single layer graphene onto carbon, onto copper, sorry. And then you can transfer this single layer graphene onto PET by dissolving copper. And you can transfer your single layer graphene onto piezoelectric quartz. And this piezoelectric quartz, we are going to use it as a working electrode in a free electrode cell. So it means that you heard about the QCM, which is a, a way to weight uh, a wigging machine with a very nice accuracy. This piezoelectric quartz has a resonant frequency. And as long as the resonant frequency, or as long as the weight on the quartz changes, then the resonant frequency changes. And this is what you do when, when you use this quartz as a working electrode here. When this quartz is used here, you can polarize the quartz in your electrolyte. And when the ions are going on the surface or are removed from the surface, the resonant frequency of the quartz changes. And you can make a correlation between the change of the resonant frequency with the weight change onto the electrode. And when you do electrochemical analysis, you do cyclic voltammetry, galvanostatic cycling, you can have access to the charge Q, you can calculate the charge Q, and if you pull out the weight change versus the charge, you have access to the molar weight of the species which are going in and out from the carbon. So this is what we did on this single layer graphene, because again, those 3D porous carbons are amorphous, but here the single layer graphene has sp2 carbon. So this is made just to show you that you can nicely coat a, a, a resonator with a, a, a graphene. This is a, you have some uncoated zone, but never mind. So now we took this single layer graphene and we have studied the adsorption of ions onto this single layer graphene. The electrolyte we took was uh, uh, EMI cation, TFSI anion, which is an ionic liquid, but you, we used first uh, acetonitrile as a solvent. And this is a kind of cyclic voltammetry that you can get. So you see, this is a current divided by a scan rate and the potential. So when you control the potential scan rate, dV over dt at 10 EV per second, if you assume that the capacitance is constant, dQ is C dV, so the current is C divided by dV over dt, this is constant, the capacitance is constant, so the current should be constant. And you have more or less a square shape for the cyclic voltammetry. It means pure electrostatic storage. This is the first thing that you can uh, get from the shape of a CD. But then what you can see as well, you can measure what we call the point of zero charge, potential of zero charge, which, which, which corresponds to the minimum of capacitance. It means that at this potential, there is a net charge of zero on your carbon surface. You immerse your carbon into the electrolyte, there may be some ion adsorption, but at this potential, the net charge on the, on the carbon is zero. Okay, what we did then was to better measure this potential of zero charge, which is super important. Uh, you, you can understand uh, in a couple of minutes. So just make a couple of uh, potential static experiments and you measure the capacitance using electrochemical impedance spectroscopy measurement. And we did that for two mole per liter EMI TFSI and acetonitrile. We change the capacitance versus the potential. And as you can see here, the minimum capacitance is here. The point of zero charge is close to zero volt versus the reference. When you go to neat EMI TFSI, when you remove a solvent, what you can see is that this potential of zero charge is strongly decreased to the negative potential. What does it mean? It means that when the single layer graphene is in contact with ionic liquid without any solvent, since the potential of zero charge has decreased a lot, it means that you have spontaneous adsorption, chemisorption of cations. Why? Because to, neutral, to neutralize this charge, you need to inject electrons on the graphene, so you need to go to lower negative potential. So here, you see that you have a strong interactions between the cation EMI plus with the single layer graphene. And then what we did, so this is a, we did a cyclic voltammetry in the neat EMI TFSI, no more solvent, and this is the CV. So quasi rectangular remember this is single layer graphene so the current is very small the frequency and, uh, and but, but it's still very nice and this is the frequency change during the cyclic voltammetry at the same time so this is the weight change correlated to the weight change on the quartz 
how to get the weight from the frequency by the Sorbet equation. And then once you have a weight, you can do the integration of the current of a cyclic voltammetry, and you get the charge Q. And if you plot the, char the, the weight sorry, versus the charge Q, you end up with this kind of plot. This is a potential of zero charge. Here, above the PCC, you are supposed to play with anion adsorption. Below the PCC, you play with cation adsorption. But this is not what we see, because from the PCC, when you inject positive charges onto a single layer graphene, like here, what you see, you see a weight loss. Weight loss means that a cation is removed from the surface. And if you calculate the molar weight, you end up with this big cluster, which is a EMI 1.58, TFSI 1.58, positively charged cluster. And this cluster was predicted, this ex the existence of this cluster was predicted by Alexei Kornichev from Imperial College, because when you, when there is no solvent in the EMI TFSI, there is no charge, no, no, sorry, no solvent to screen the charge between the ions, and you form these big ion clusters. But here, what is interesting also is that from the negative charge, when you go to, when you inject negative uh, electrons to the graphene, there is no weight change. However, there is still a capacitive storage. And this means that you cannot explain this capacitive storage by an ion flux, a net ion flux on the electrolyte. What we, and what we found with, by, uh, I would say, molecular dynamics, it is just by this big EMI plus cations, which, va which have a imidazolium ring, at the, at the OCV, they are perpendicular to the electrode, and when you inject electrons into the graphene, they just simply orientate to balance the charge that you inject into the graphene. And this is the first example, I will say, of uh, charge storage just by electrolyte organization, just simply by changing the orientation of the cations onto the surface without any ion flux. And it means that you play, you change locally the dielectric constant of the electrolyte. So this is very important uh, because it, it shows you that if you control the PCC of your material, you can have a charge storage mechanism without any net ion flux onto your electrode. And then this is the previous weight versus Q charge onto your uh, single layer graphene. I need uh, ionic liquid, and when you add acetonitrile electrolyte to a uh, solvent to this uh, EMI, TFSI, EMI TFSI, you can see that you completely change here the ionic flux onto the graphene. Here you move from PCC, when you inject positive charge, you only see a weight increase, which is anion adsorption. When you inject negative charge into the graphene, you only see weight increase, cation adsorption. So is a uh, uh, simply a, a huge change in the charge storage mechanism. And uh, this is just because you screen the charges between the ion and there is no more cation adsorption onto the graphene. So it means that uh, we, we reach also a high uh, uh, surface, uh, surface area capacitance. With, uh, we, we, here the capacitance was doubled when you increase, when you had solvent. So it means that as a conclusion that the pore size is important for increasing the capacity of the carbon, but the local structure of the carbon is also super important. And this means that the best carbon materials will be porous carbons with local sp2 carbon structure. And this is what we are uh, currently uh, working on. So the next uh, step I'm going to talk about, oh, there is a slide missing. Anyway, it's not a big deal. Um, I'm going to talk now about, uh, uh, I will say, how to increase the uh, reaction rate in battery materials. So we still use the modern materials, which are called muxine. I don't know if you heard about muxine, which were, which were developed by Yuri Gagotzi and Michel Barzum. So you take, so you take a max phase. Max phase is, for instance, is early transition metal. It's valve metal and carbon and nitrogen. Here is the example of TI3 LC2. So TI3 layers, uh, uh, and here, so TI3 C2 layers, aluminum, TI3 C2 layers, aluminum. What you can do is you can etch those materials, which are metal carbide, in HF on the Li or LIF in HCl. And then you completely etch aluminum layers. And then you end up with those 2D metal carbides, TR3C2 here. But the point is that when you do that, you, uh, you have some functional groups onto your TR3C2 2D materials, which are, in that case, fluorine and OH, surface group. And we, we oops, it was in fact this slide. Anyway, it's not a big deal. Um, so uh, we use those materials 
it's like uh, the, this is a, a schematic image of this material. This is a true SCM image. So uh, when you have those TFC2 2D materials, you see here the interior is highly, fastly accessible to ions. And when you polarize those materials in sulfuric acid, you can inject electrons and you, can have, prot you have proton intercalation and you play with titanium 2-3, uh, I would say, a uh, uh, redox state. It works very nicely. You have very high capacity, but is in aqueous electrolyte. The problem is that those materials are not active for lithium intercalation in non-aqueous electrolyte. So what we did uh, two years ago, uh, we tried to uh, uh, get rid of those uh, uh, su su surface groups because obviously the surface chemistry of study materials controls the electrochemical properties. So when you prepare those materials by etching in uh, HF electrolyte or lithium fluoride plus HCl, obviously you end up with fluorine and OH uh, and O surface groups. So we wanted to prepare muxines with a completely different chemistry. And to do that, and especially we wanted to remove fluorine. And to do that, what we did, still to prepare model materials, we prepared muxines from, I would say, uh, molten salt root. You take a, a copper chloride a powder, you mix with potassium chloride and sodium chloride, and you heat at 750 Celsius degree. And you take your max phase, it's not aluminum here, it's silicon, TA3, silicon C2. And when you heat your max phase in this, uh, I would say, Lewis acid, molten salt, then what you do is that you, are, you have a reduction of copper 2 plus into copper and oxidation of silicon into silicon 4 plus and you end up with Ti3C2, the muxine, with solid copper and you remove silicon by gas, gas phase. And this is the material that you prepare at the end. This is a lamellar accordion-like Ti3C2. And what you can do is that you have to wash after the synthesis, you have to wash your, your material because you have a copper here, uh, because here. And uh, with ammonium persulfate, you can easily oxidize the copper and remove the copper, and you have a 0, 0, L uh, peak uh, uh, on the XRD diffraction, showing you that you have good, the nice expected 2D material. And the composition here was titanium-3, carbon close to 2, oxygen chloride. There was no OH, there is no o hydroxy group onto the surface. This is we checked by TPDMS. So this is only titanium. Uh, carbon, chloride, and oxygen terminated, no H. So this material is fluorine free and free of OH. And then we did the electrochemistry, electrochemical characterization. First, we started from the conventional muxine prepared from HF etching. So oxygen, OH, and uh, fluorine containing. So you can see that in a LP30 electrolyte, when you do the lithium intercalation, in fact, you have a very poor signal, I would say. You have a broad, uh, 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 broad CV with peaks which are not well defined, but what you see is that the lithium intercalation occurs within about three volts. So it's not a good anode, it's not a good cathode. And it's a sequential intercalation of lithium plus. You see uh, all those limitations. You have a huge polarization here on, uh, on, on recharge. Well, it's not really good. And when you now use your uh, fluorine free, chlorine terminated muxine that we prepared just by simply changing the chemistry of the surface, which is the same core material, you see that the electrochemical signature is completely different. First, you have something which is highly symmetric. You have no more peaks. You have diffusion, you have a diff, non-diffusion limited redox reaction. And what is uh, really interesting is that you have uh, all the intercalation occurs within two volts, below two volts, sorry, uh, down to 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.2 uh, volt versus lithium. And again, this is very symmetric, cyclic voltammetry means very fast lithium intercalation in the material. And to confirm that, what you can do, uh, you can do some, uh, I would say, C-rate cycling. So this is a conventional muxine prepared from HF etching. What you can see is that when you see the capacitance change with the cycle number, a different discharge current. So when you charge and discharge in one hour, you have uh, 125 uh, milliampere per gram. And when you do that in six minutes, you, are, you have about uh, 40, 15 milliampere per gram. In the same conditions, if you take your uh, material, which is free from free urine and so on and so on, chlorinated only, what you can see is that one C rate, one hour charge is charged, 200 milliampere per gram, and you can even have, uh, I would say, 
uh, 100 milliampere per gram at 100C, means 36 seconds charge discharge. And again, this is only by changing the chemistry of a material. So those materials are not the ones which are expected to be used in lithium ion batteries, but because it's so tricky to prepare. But anyway, this, this is used to try to understand what are the key factors, what, are, uh, what, what you can do with, uh, with the chemistry and materials to try to improve the performance. Okay, so why such improved performance? Uh, this is an operando X-ray diffraction, so this is a 002 peak here that we track during the reduction, intercalation of lithium, deintercalation of lithium. What you can see that this peak of a Maxine structure does not change that much first. And the despacing is about 11 Armstrong. And 11 Armstrong, if you have 11 Armstrong for the despacing here, it means that between the layers, you have a space of below three Armstrong. What does it mean? It means that most of your lithium here that you put between the layers are desolvated. So it shows here again that when you desolvate, partially desolvate your lithium, then you can increase the capacity of your material. And this, is, this rings a bell to, compared to what we have heard also uh, regarding the carbon. And if we try to put those results in a, in a more global perspective, uh, so if you consider a pore size or uh, I would say an interlayer distance, a big interlayer, large interlayer distance, then you can see that you can put all your ions, cations and ions, fully solvated. And when you can do that, you are in the situation of a double layer. I introduced you to when, when I dis mentioned about uh, uh, porous carbons. And it means that your accessibility, accessibility is quite fat, but you store the charge mainly by double layer. Again, this is typically the case of porous carbon in uh, electrolyte. And so what you have here. And you have <coughs> high power but limited capacity or capacitance. And you can do to the extreme of a case where you have a very small space in the pores or small space between the 2D materials. And in that case, all your cation, lithium, for instance, enter fully desolvated. And this is the case in, for instance, this is lithium intercalation in graphite because you know that lithium in graphite intercalates fully desolvated, otherwise you exfoliate the graphite, this is why you don't use PC. But this is also the case of a lithium intercalation in NMC. And in that case, so you have a full charge transfer, you play with redox reaction, you have a high capacity, but obviously diffusion limitation. And the question is, what happens in between? This is a, a, a paper that we published years ago, and <coughs> This is a cyclic voltammetry, again, for a porous carbon with two nanometer pore size. All the ions can have access freely. But here, if you decrease the pore size from two nanometers to one nanometer, in this electrolyte, you have a pore size which is very close to the desolvated ion size. And what you can see is that you have here this bump appearing. And this bump, initially, you can see, by well, this is a redox reaction. But in fact, it's not a redox reaction because we did some experiment at that time, and we have shown that this peak here, the intensity of this peak, follows a potential scaling rate. So it means that it's something which is not diffusion limited. It's not a redox reaction. And what we have said at that time, it was that it was a partial charge transfer between the adsorbed ion to the carbon because the ion was able to get close to the carbon and transfer a part of its charge to the carbon surface. And this is what we have demonstrated in 2017 in a, another paper with colleagues from modeling and uh, uh, this is another story. So this result, you see, when you confine the ions, when the pore size is close to the ion size, you may have an extra trash transfer partial from the ion to the carbon. And all those two results I show you fits perfectly in this scheme where you have a very high uh, I would say, interlayer distance of pore size, when you have everything entering solvated, you only play with double layer, limited capacitance, and here you play with redox intercalation reactions, but limited power, and in between, you have this gray zone where it's a kind of continuum where you can have ions entering partially desolvated, and in that case, they still have a very fast diffusion inside your material, but are able to partially transfer a part of a charge into your material, and then you increase the capacity, but you still keep high diffusivity. So <clears throat> this kind of transition region, this is something that we have uh, 
uh, we are now exploring with over materials, trying to reproduce those results and trying to find uh, uh, in this kind of transition region a new, uh, I, would, I would say, playground, playground, play, playground to uh, prepare materials with uh, better uh, capacity and better uh, and higher power. Okay, so this is the end. I guess I'm uh, more or less on time. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, thank my, my colleague, obviously, and I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thanks a lot, Patrice, and uh, for sure. Uh, don't take it off yet. Maybe there's questions. Uh, please. If everyone else is looking for coffee, I'm still going to push a question to you. So it was very specific, this cluster you mentioned, 1.58, uh, 0 0.58. I mean, how is one to understand those precise numbers or, or what is the mm. real yeah. aggregate size? No, no, it's, you, you're fully right. It's not true. Uh, Konichev predicted the existence of positive charge clusters. And obviously, what we ended, we ended up with this value just because from the molar weight of we estimated, calculated from EQCM. But this might not be the real truth. Uh, it might be uh, the message is that this is a positively charged cluster combining anion and cations that is dissolved from the surface of a graphene, then being 1.58 or 1.5. But it has or one a significant point. size. Yeah, it has a significant size, but it's not a single cation or single anion. It's a cluster positively charged. Mm. So this is uh, the key message. Okay. Yeah. Looking out of the audience, people tend to be shy or very much looking forward to the coffee. Uh, but I think that we give a round of hands of applause to all the speakers.